The ending again is quite ambiguous, where you move actually into the photo of the Carol. Are we supposed to surmise that perhaps she was abused as a child? Uh, you can do what you want. Uh, it's, it's a free country. But don't ever ask me to explain any of my pictures. <laughs> The first picture which is going to make would have to make a great deal of impact. Ah! Be sensational. <laughs> be as sexual as the censors will allow in those days. Without you for another minute. As a result of uh, our discussions and my advice in that direction, Roman, in Paris, Richard Brach wrote an outline of what became then repulsion, which was the story of this mentally uh, disturbed young girl, a manicurist in London. There was a girl that we both knew who lo looked tremendously innocent, and then we learned certain things about her uh, which surprised us. And that was somehow the starting point. You know, a girl who looks very innocent and who's got some kind of a mental problem. Who, who is even a schizophrenic and can be uh, dangerous. Then Roman said, well, he really didn't like it. I said, Roman, it's just fine. It's absolutely fine. Let's go on with it. We made a date, remember? We're having supper tonight. Oh, I forgot. Oh. Already in the script, we tried to develop a little bit of psychology, but I had in mind a way of upgrading this film into a psychological thriller, mm -hmm. not just a cheap horror film. I made the rounds with Roman to all the major American uh, production distribution company who were then very, uh, very active in London, like Columbia, Paramount, United Artists. By that time, Roman already was famous. He's been to Hollywood, was dominated. They all loved to meet him, but no, thank you, no. Then went through the English company, it's Anglo Amalgamated, uh, British Lion, Associated British, as they were in those days, and still no takers. And so, we ended up knocking at the door of Compton Films, which was a small distributors, producers, exhibitors there at cinemas, and dealing primarily in exploitation pictures or soft porno. And they were uh, looking for somebody like me who could give the group a little bit of uh, respectability or good press for little money. They came to see me because they had a script for a film which Roman would direct and, and Gene would produce for me. We haggled over the budget for a little while and I agreed, we, make, we did a deal that they would make the film. It was a tough deal. We budgeted the film at about 65,000 pounds, which to them the was the most expensive film they've ever wished to make. The budget was one which I felt we could, we could uh, cope with. I committed myself, and I felt this, this was a film had to be made. It, it, was, it was too good to uh, turn away. Poor little girl. All by itself. I saw a couple of films shot by Gil Taylor, uh, particularly Dr. Strangelove, and I thought it was fantastic. And uh, the look of the picture was extremely important for me. And he liked the feel and texture of what I was doing. And uh, that was the first thing he said when he met me. He said, how do you get these lovely, warm, strong shadows. I think that I diagnosed it absolutely top weighted of him being something special we should encourage, especially after Knife in the Water. Gil Taylor saw Knife in the Water and she said yes immediately. Compton didn't because of his salary. They wanted somebody else about half the price and he stuck out and said I did it. Well, I, I, that was wonderful because it, I, I, I learned so much from Roman. I said, Compton Techley, don't they, isn't that a, a soft porn picture house in Compton Street? 
And he said, yes, it is. The people who are financing and are organizing the picture own that movie house. So um, uh, I said, OK, what's the story? Is it a soft porn movie? And he said, no, not at all. It's a horror movie. And I said, well, that might be interesting. None of the people I were working with knew how girls who shared a flat lived. They were all married, and a bunch of old buggers, as far as I was concerned, I mean, who were old enough to be my father, with the exception of Roman. And the ones who weren't old enough to be my father had been married for sort of 20 years or so, and had never been into the flat of two girls who live in Kensington. And this hit me when I first started talking to Roma because he wanted to know the style of the, of the flat. So I explained that the kind of girls they were, it would be a, an old, what we would call a mansion flat. And particularly had to be a mansion flat because we wanted top shots down into the street and top shots down into the nunnery. But the other thing was the dressing of you know, how people live, which is the bits and pieces, not just the walls and the architecture, but the bits and pieces and the furniture that they have around them. I started to describe it, and I realized I couldn't because they had no idea what I was talking about. Just because I go out once, there's no need to start sulking. I'm not sulking. I phoned up various girls who I knew who shared flats in London and said impromptu with a, with a stills cameraman, can I come over and visit, just to say hi, maybe have a coffee? Um, I've got a cameraman with me to take some photographs. He wants to take some photographs of your wallpaper. And they say, yeah, come on over. Why does he want to take a picture of the wallpaper? I said, well, you know, art direction. Oh, that stuff. OK, sure, come on over. So when we arrived at a flat, I'd say to the stills cameraman, when we go in, I'll go to the left with the girl who opens the door. You come in after me and go immediately to the right and go straight into the bathroom. And of course, he would go into the bathroom and it would be full of hanging up sort of ladies' knickers, bras. And, he, and the problem was, he said he couldn't take any photographs in the first place. I said, well, for God's sake, pull some of them down uh, out of the way so that you can take a photograph, then put them back up afterwards. He said, well, all right. And of course, he was disgusted. He was a married man and he lived in Shepparton and had a nice little bijou bungalow. Um, and he'd been there for the last 40 years or whatever. And he just couldn't believe that people live like this. And these were all middle class and some of them upper middle class girls. And he said, it's disgusting the way these girls live. I said, yeah. And he said, the things I've seen in the bathroom. I said, well, to photograph the floor, the ceiling, the wall, the windows, everything, the toilet, Let's have a look at it. But we did about half a dozen flats like that. And we came back and I spread them out for the benefit of Roman and the other people who were interested. And Roman, it was intriguing. He loved it. He thought it was absolutely wonderful. You filthy bitch. I'm sorry. Who is this? Who is this? Who is this? Who do you think, you filthy little tart? Catherine was not very well known yet. It was not like getting a start at would allow you to sell the picture all over. Compton had all list of uh, proposals which uh, I didn't want to hear of because I thought that Catherine was just right for the part. I mean, she's not only one of the most beautiful girls I've ever photographed. She is, she's beautiful. And a very talented young lady and she knew it and she tried to force this on Roman several times, but you couldn't, he could, she couldn't do it because nobody can. It's a, he wears you down and he brings you to tears and back. But you do it in the end, his way. Catherine was fantastic. I, I, rem I have only uh, good memories of working with her. It was like a tango, you know. She wanted me to direct her. There was no um, animosity that sometimes you develop with, with, with actors, mainly with men, because you just tell them what to do, you see and man has his pride. It's easier with women uh, in general but, uh, because they just don't care, you know. They don't have these ego problems that male actors have something. She was absolutely faultless. She did everything Roman asked her to do, I think, except undressing. <laughs> she had this problem, you know, she wanted to wear panties under the nightgown, then you could see uh, through the nightgown. Sometimes you could see a little bit of body through it. But, you know, it's normal, the normal reaction. All 
the time we we were looking for something to make it look odd, and if it didn't look odd, we would change the setup until it did look odd. I wanted to have the feeling of the distance increasing throughout the picture as the madness was taking over, or rather overwhelming the girl. I wanted to uh, have the feeling of great perspective. And for that reason, I was decreasing the focal length of the lenses um, to have a wider and wider angle. But with wide angle lens, you come close if you want to have a tight shot. And if you come close, you distort the face. The only way I could get this breaking up of the texture of the face was to use an 18 millimeter right on top of her nose, um, which made her look a bit crazy. And uh, <laughs> Gil didn't want a leading lady's uh, face distorted. I hated that, to be contrary, a beautiful girl like that. And I used to say to Roman, I don't like this at all. He used to say, oh, get on with it. It didn't matter to me. What was important was the, the impression that you get from the scene. But also, I wanted the set to transform. Roman had this idea that among things to, to distort would be the set itself and to make these narrow corridors terribly wide and leave the furniture in the middle of the room but extend the walls, uh, which rather took me back a bit. I, d I didn't fight against it. I thought I just have to try and keep up with it. I had a very good crew and I think the crew liked me because I remember once going over the agreed time and I could see the, the production managers getting paler and paler from minute to minute and nobody said a word. And they told me afterwards that it was absolutely unusual. His attention, his focus, uh, I found it very exciting and quite exhausting because he never gives up and never lets go. And if you enthuse about his enthusiasm, uh, you have a little wonder man there who's, who's quite, it will turn out quite startling things. I had almost the same feeling on the Hitchcock movie because these people are few and far between that um, have this magnetism, this enthusiasm. Uh, in fact, I can honestly say there's the one movie where I loved going in in the morning and I hated going home at night and I didn't like weekends off. That's how much I got into this. I think we are having rabbit. Rabbit? Oh. I thought they'd all been killed off. For the rabbit scene, just before we started the movie, he put a rabbit in the fridge and turned the, the electricity off. And on the day of doing this kitchen scene, she opens the fridge and about a million flies fly out. I couldn't believe it. I said, well, I said You're, we should infect the whole of Twickenham with some terrible disease from these flies, this is true. And we stuck with this, we worked on this for the morning, but it was impossible. It was, the smell was so awful that we eventually got the, the rabbit the props had made as, instead of. But we did, but that's what Roman did. I mean, Roman is a strange man. He, 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 wanted, he wanted this for real, so he did it. <laughs> what the hell is this? No wonder you look ill if you have things like this hanging around. Since it was a, a cheapo cheapo production, we didn't have a special effect men, we just had um, a prop man who would have to help us with creating certain special effects. What I did was I got the production bio and told her to go to a, um, a condom factory, Durex, and get me and test the rubber there by shoving her hands through it and get me large sheets of it. And I had a frame made up and we stretched it over that and shoved her hands through it from behind and lo and behold, it worked. <laughs> Thank you.
<laughs> there was a bit of an argument about how many hands were actually needed. And we asked um, Gene Gotowski, and he said, no, Polanski wants exactly as it is. Uh, idiotic fight with 10 seconds since the 12 hands are just as good as 24, which was, you know, was an artistic issue, you know. Then Klinger then said, well, OK, then, I'll find another director. That made Polanski um, come to terms. I think he, le he, he lessened by three or four hands. It was a token thing, and everybody was happy. When Carol hits the boy on, on the head, I have always imagined that it happens just as he looks through the peephole. And uh, I wanted to have a subjective shot of what he sees. Uh, he sees the neighbor with the dog on, on the other side of the landing, and then the hit, and the whole thing sort of swivels, and we see a few drops of blood on the door as he falls down. Uh, that subjective shot required a very big peep hole because you can't shoot through a real one. And therefore, very big door. And I built a peep hole glass the size of a ship's porthole. He prepared all that was necessary to have the drops of blood, which would be in right proportion to the peep hole like this, that means that the drops had to be about uh, six inches long. And uh, 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 that could be done only with this, uh, with the motorcycle pump. It was another scene when uh, Catherine cuts up the landlord. It was going to be shot first thing. They'd sent the taxi for her and it, it had been delayed. It wasn't her fault. The taxi was delayed in traffic. It was traffic time. Polanski started to speak to her in French. The little French I know, I believe there were some swear words there as well. She just stood there, and the whole crew was standing there waiting to shoot, and he just carried on telling her off in French. And eventually, she blew her top. You could see, she, you could see her face go into anger, to scream anger. He then put the very razor in his hand, he said, now go kill the landlord. I do know that during his time he worked with us, he was the most unusual form of direction. Uh, he was a brilliant man, completely dedicated to the work he was doing, and uh, not easy to get on with, because he had to have things his way. Uh, we went over budget right from the beginning and behind the schedule. It was so tight that it was totally unrealistic. I know the film went over budget. And there were quite a few um, uh, hard, harsh words said about that. Rome was continuously in trouble with, with them over his... He took a long time to line up. Um, he wanted to get everything absolutely right, and, and it did appear to them that he was taking too long to line up. It wasn't taking too long, but they thought it was. But a lot of producers don't seem to understand, or a lot of filmmakers don't understand, that you can't just expect one take or two take or three take movies. In t terrible television shows, films for television, of which I've made many, you hear producers saying, this director's wonderful, three takes is his maximum. It's, it, what it means is he doesn't give a shit. And I had to go to his, to go and talk to them rather <laughs> strongly and then t tell them how important, how wonderful these movies were going to be. If you're going to have something worth showing, go for it. So the number of takes, anybody who whinges and moans about that, shouldn't be in the film business, or shouldn't have hired a quality director. You never achieve anything if you don't, if you do it half cock. There were a lot of things that I couldn't do the way I, I wished, simply because I didn't have physical means to do it because I didn't have enough time, because I didn't have enough uh, money. Uh, so uh, I just got used to the fact that that's how it is. We agreed on the budget because we, uh, as in, in the way running a, a cinema and a small distribution company, we kept our costs down to a minimum. 
and uh, the budget for this film, we expected the film not to exceed that budget because it was stretching us. They were not a big company. Um, uh, if I make fun of them and uh, talk about certain shortcomings, it doesn't mean that I uh, didn't appreciate giving, giving me chance and that they were uh, not good to me. I liked them very much both. Roman did the cut, and we were all very keen to see it. And we were all assembled in this viewing theater. The film was shown, and the lights came up. And there was total silence. And Roman misunderstood this silence. And he stood up and said, put it down to youthful indiscretion. And Peter Sellers' agent stood up and said, may you produce lots of youthful indiscretion. That's the most amazing piece of film I've ever seen in my life. I wouldn't touch her. Don't touch her. To me, it was interesting that Roman initially felt unsure himself. No other film has ever shown with such intense reality the terrifying journey into madness. The censorship was very strict in, in Britain then. Uh, the censor was John Trevelyan, and he was uh, uh, tough, but he loved movies at the same time. And he also had an advisor who was a psychiatrist. He showed him the film when we submitted it to the censor. And uh, he was uh, very impressed with the film and said that from a psychiatrist's standpoint, it was absolutely right. I remember he asked uh, what kind of research we did with Gerard Brash. We didn't do any research. Taking you inside the mind of a girl driven to insanity. It show up into absolutely rave reviews, rave reviews in England and in America, everywhere in Europe, but in America particularly. Well, it was during the time of the Berlin Film Festival, and it was announced as the, as the, the winning. And my partner, um, bless his soul, <laughs> he's dead now, he always used to go and collect the things. And uh, I believe his, um, his, his family still have the, the actual silver bear. Because Michael Klinger collected and said, well, I'll bring it to you, boys. And of course, didn't never turned it over and kept it. Basically stole it. Ah, I thought I'd seen everything. This is a flaming nut house. Well, the surprise was that the film was very well received and started making money. So uh, Compton people were happy and they said, let's do a next one. Mm -hmm.